You are listening to the Slow Living Podcast, and I'm your host, Stephanie O'Day. What if I told you that you could truly have the life of your dreams, the life you've always wanted, one filled with abundance, joy, and a sense of purpose? It's absolutely possible, and I see it each and every day with my coaching clients. It all starts with learning how to slow down. You deserve to live the life you've always dreamt about. Let's get started. Hi there, Slow Down Society. Welcome back to episode 118 of the Slow Living Podcast. Today, I am so thrilled that I have the host of the Calm Mom podcast with us, Michelle Grosser. And not only is Michelle a mom, a life coach, a system fitness expert, an attorney, she is here as a mom of two little baby girls who are five and six years old. And I think we can all agree that those are very busy ages. And so, Michelle, thank you for being here. And I would love to know how you keep all the balls in the air and still be a calm mom. Thank you for having me. How do I keep all the balls in the air and stay a calm mom? I think... I think I have tried to reduce the number of balls in the air as much as I can. So I think that is a huge first step in just realizing that, yes, life with a five and six-year-old, life as a mom, life in 2023 can be incredibly busy, um, but it doesn't have to be. So we have control over a lot of it. And I think that when we take that accountability and we're not afraid to peel back and we step away from, you know, fear of missing out or whatever else it is Mm. that's coming up, um, that it gives us a lot of freedom. And then I also think on the second, on the second side of it or or, or other side of it is that, um, if I was doing all I'm doing, in addition to that, my husband and I planted a church here in Miami about two years ago. Wow! So I'm also, thank you, pastoring a church, which is takes a lot of bandwidth, right? To do that midweek ministries and everything. So we manage a full staff there. So we've got a lot going on. Um, And if you had asked me to do all of this seven years ago, eight years ago, I just know that I didn't have the capacity to do it. I didn't have the skills. I didn't have the space in my nervous system to handle all of that without being chronically dysregulated, right? Running on anxiety and overwhelm and all of the things that a lot of us face Um, But I've done so much work with my nervous system. And that's now what I teach uh, women how to do. So that has actually increased my capacity to be able to hold more of life without feeling overwhelmed. Um, And there's a lot of systems and habits and structure. I think that goes into that also and mindsets, but really just learning how to to hold more um, without it stressing me out has been a skill that I have worked at honing. intentionally for the last you know d- decade or so so if you were i don't know i like i'm going to use the word alien for lack of a better <laughs> term but if you were someone like from above watching um from another planet you doing all of the things yeah would would that um adjective of calm be yeah. there or is it that you're doing all of the things and you found a way to turn it calm? Yeah. So I think it's both. I think I tend to run at a current that is fairly calm, um, but it's intentional, right? I wasn't just born born this way. Like if you came to see me seven years ago, I was probably, you know, sitting at my desk at a law firm, completely overworked, stressed out, wanting to cry, um, not spending any time with my husband and just feeling really stressed and overwhelmed and anxious and, and all of these things. Um, so, so it's not necessarily my, my tendency. I'm not necessarily wired that way. But I think like anything else, it's something that we can hone over time. So I think if you look at my day from above, probably it does flow fairly calmly. Um, We have great morning time together as a family and it's beautiful. And it's part of my favorite time of the day. I wake up before my kids, which is one of my favorite (laughs) hacks for moms ever. It's changed my life. Um, And then I surround myself with really great people um, that I can delegate to and that help me, you know, show up in the ways that I want to show up. And I stop working every day around 3 p.m. And I pick up my kids and I hang out with them. Um, 
but I think there's this fallacy that I do it all. And I think we mm. look at a lot of a women, a lot of women that do that. And, and it's a facade. It's like that Pinterest home that, you know, is in the same, whatever aesthetic palette or whatever. It's, it's not real, right? It's, it's, it's the highlight reel. So I think when we can acknowledge that I don't, no one does it all. Um, and there are a lot of things that I say no to, or don't do so that I can do the things that are important to me. Um, and I have tools overarching tools, habits and systems, and in the moment tools when I am feeling overwhelmed and anxious um, to bring myself back to a space of regulation and return calm to my body. To your body. So I'm a huge proponent of paying myself first with morning time also. Um, Is that, and you said earlier, that was one of your biggest hacks. So what does your sort of self-regulation time in the morning look like? Yeah. So, so for myself and for the women that I coach, um, as far as I I like to do it as a morning routine, part of it as a morning routine, and then part of it throughout the day. But there are three things that I do every day to really nourish my nervous system. And the first one is at least 10 minutes of stillness. So when I wake up, um, you know, I'll have water. Um, sometimes I'll have a cup of coffee, depending on how I'm feeling in my nervous system. I'll just take an inventory. Some days I wake up anxious and I've got a lot going on And those days. I won't have a cup of coffee first thing in the morning. I'll wait until later in the day. Um, once I've had breakfast, but some days I know I can handle it and I'll do that. And then it's 10 minutes, really a stillness. It's not listening to a podcast. It's not, um, you know, any sort of stimulation because heaven knows we get enough of that, um, as moms. And so a lot of it for me is prayer. It is reading. It is journaling. Um, So that's 10 minutes of stillness and then 10 minutes of movement. So I try to get a workout in before my kids wake up on most days. Um, On the days where I can't, I'll just go for a walk over my lunch break or even just sit on the floor and do some stretching. Um, It's so nourishing to our nervous system to get movement in every day. It's really important to move a lot of that anxious energy that we tend to hold on to. And then the last thing is my favorite thing. And it's 10 minutes of play every day. Um, and it's not playing Barbies with my daughters. Um, Cause that is not always enjoyable to me, right? Like, let's just be real. <laughs> let's just be real. Sometimes it is when I have the capacity for it. Um, but sometimes it's not. And my 10 minutes of play is really 10 minutes pouring into something that I am passionate about that brings me joy. So maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's having, you know, coffee with a friend in the morning. Maybe it's, um, I don't know, playing an instrument that I, someone loves to play, or maybe it's doing a puzzle, or maybe it's, I don't know, putting on your favorite song and just dancing. But when we get those three things in throughout the day, um, I think it has such a huge impact on our outlook and our ability to really manage everything else. When you say 10 minutes, are you yeah. super structured with that? And like you set a timer actually for 10 minutes, or is it just kind of feeling your way into it? If you're in the mood to sit for longer than 10 minutes and be still, will you? Yeah, I certainly will. It's not structured at all. I try to aim for at least 10 minutes, which feels very doable to me. Um, so that doesn't feel overwhelming then. And if I get seven minutes in, I focus on that gain and that's awesome. And if I get 20 minutes in, that's perfect. Um, but yeah, my my goal is more to do it consistently than to do it a certain you know amount of time every day. Um, but yeah, there's definite flexibility there. Flexibility. And then with a five and a six-year-old, are you in charge of what time they wake up? Do you wake them up or do they get up on their own? They get up on their own. Um, they also go to bed really early and that's just something <laughs> that, that I really believe in. Um, I know it's different for every family. I live in Miami. A lot of my friends are from South America and their kids go to bed at, you know, 10, 11 PM. And it's kind of like a cultural thing. Um, but in our home, I mean, my kids are asleep by seven fifteen, seven thirty. So by, you know, six, six thirty in the morning, they're up and they're in good spirits and they've slept well and they're ready to go. Yeah. Um, we, d- we did something very similar, um, with our kids, uh, and I think it's, they just need more sleep they do. Than, than people might think they do. But my kids needed 10 to 12 hours of sleep. Yeah. Um, and so there were times we would, especially in the winter when it's nice and dark out oh. early, it's great. You can start the bedtime routine at 530. Um, but it was it was a fun way for my husband and I then to um, watch a movie 
yes. at night on in on a Wednesday for no reason and order Chinese food. I'm like, oh my gosh, this totally counts as a date. Like, I love everything about this and we haven't left the house. Yes. Yes to all of that. We do the same thing. Yeah. 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 It, it's, um, yeah, I, re- I really enjoy it. It's interesting when they get older and then um, you have soccer practice and gymnastics yeah. practice. We had a time where gymnastics was 4.30 to 8.30 every night. And I remember talking to the coach and I'm like, well, how do people eat dinner? How do they get their kids on to bed on time? She just sort of looked at me and she's like, I don't know. I don't know. They just do. I don't know. Like, 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 it's like, I wanted a recipe of, well, how do you do this? <laughs> yeah. Give me a plan. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. That's oh funny. Goodness. So the last few episodes on, um, this podcast have been talking about the the quote unquote elusive American dream and mm-hmm. and the idea of whether or not it's dead and um and whether or not you feel and and you kind of not you in particular Michelle mm-hmm. Grosser but in general if people think that there's still the same amount of opportunity to live out the life you've always kind of dreamt about and I just wondered yeah. what your thoughts were on that. Hmm. I think a lot of us are probably disillusioned by what that life actually is. Um, I know a lot of us grow up and we are, you know, the either the overachievers who are just like have constantly been drilled, like you're going to go to college and then you're going to have this degree and then you're going to do this job and you're going to make money or whatever, have the house with the white picket fence. Um, And I think for a lot of us, we've never really been encouraged or taken the time to ask ourselves, like, what is it that I actually want to do? And that really, that question really hits home for me because that's been a big exploration of mine in the last five or so years. I've been practicing law for the last 12, I guess. Um, And it wasn't really until the pandemic that I even had the thought to ask myself, like, is this what I want to be doing? (laughs) Do I, uh, is this all I want to be doing? Um, Is there a way that I could restructure this or set new boundaries or new intention here to do it in a way that allows me to, you know, serve other people and also expand um, my, my circles of influence. And that was a, that was a lot of awareness for me because I had never thought that I went to law school because I graduated undergrad in 2008 and it was this big economic collapse and no one was really hiring. And I'm like, well, I'm good at school. I'll just go to more school. (laughs) And no one in my family was ever a lawyer. Um, And I loved law school and I really loved being a lawyer and I still do. um, But there's a lot that comes with that, that if you don't have really good boundaries, which I Mm -hmm. didn't, and if you are a people pleaser, which I was, Mm -hmm. um, you will just run yourself ragged so quickly. So for me, especially in having children, I really had to get clear on what my values were, what was actually important to me and not just put on by society or by my parents or or some other um some other person that had a lot of influence over me and kind of rethink all of it and question everything and then kind of wipe the slate clean and and start over based on my values and my intention and the beautiful and empowering thing is that each of us can do that any day, right? Yeah. It's like it's never too late. Um, but I think just a real deep rethinking of what that means for us. And the truth is that everything comes at a cost, right? So we yeah. might look at someone and be like, you know, they have this or they have that, or they're able to do this, or I see them on vacation with their family and I'm stuck here working, with whatever it is, but there's a cost to all of it. And a lot of that cost remains hidden. We're really good at hiding those costs from other people, right? Um, but they're true. So we have to weigh those costs and then make the decisions um, for ourselves and for our family. Yeah. I like that you shared that. And I think in general, if you are good at school um, Mm -hmm. and if you are kind of a people pleaser and, and it's not your fault. And, and if this sounds like you and you're listening, it's not your fault because that's what school does. School tells you and, and your parents tell you, if you do it this way, you're going to win. If you do it this way, you'll get a good grade. And if you get a good grade, then you can do this and then you can do this and then you can do this. And so we're, I I sort of like to just sort of joke with people when I'm on a coaching call with them is like, so we were raised to be trained seals that if you do this, you get a fish or you get a gold star or you get an A. But in real life, when you're the actual grown up, you can decide that maybe you don't want 
the three bedroom house with the two car garage with the picket fence because really you'd rather travel and live in a van and and get to go to a new city every day and work online. Like that is okay. Like, like you get to decide and that's tricky because you're not following a recipe anymore. You're not following like a step-by-step approach. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's funny because you and I um, were recording this after I just spoke to you for your own podcast. So if you're listening to this, you're listening to this on the Slow Living Podcast, but then later go find our same interview-ish on uh, the Calm Mom Podcast because we talked about how people want that recipe and that is marketing hype. That's do it this way and it's going to work no matter what. Well, we know that doesn't work because that's why the diet industry is $40 bazillion every year annually. Because if it was as simple as calories in, calories out, we wouldn't need to buy any sort of plan or supplement or or whatever it is. Um, But but that's so tricky because when you're in school, you're told get good grades, do this, get into a good college, get this good job. And the rules change constantly. Like you're kind of building this on on sometimes what feels like um, sand or, or an unsteady um, foundation. And I'll, I'll tell you that with my own kids who are great kids and very successful students, what yeah. worked for my oldest to get into a UC, a certain GPA, didn't work for my middle child three yeah. years later because mm-hmm. the UCs were heavily impacted because of a bunch of kids delaying enrollment because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So she actually did better on her SATs and and didn't get as many offers. And that sucks. Don't say bad words. Is suck a bad word? I don't know. But but I mean, and and then as a parent to watch this, like the kid did it all right. That's frustrating. And and it's not fair and it's not right. And, and, And pretending that, that the feelings don't matter or aren't there is, is wrong. That's, that's gaslighting. Absolutely. Acknowledge all of the feels and yeah. then decide on purpose. So I love this, Michelle, mm-hmm. that you decided, gosh, <laughs> do I really want to, to do this? And, and if I do, how do I make it work? How do I create these boundaries so I can still be the, the human I want to be, the mom I want to be, the, the ministry that you're building, um, the wife you want to be, and the attorney. Um, I have all the gold stars in the world for you. I'm so impressed. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot and it's um, it's uncomfortable and it's risky, I think, to do these things. Um, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And And, you know, we have one go around. So that was kind of... A big part of it for me too is like, man, I can keep doing what I'm doing and get caught in the rat race, um, just like everyone else. And there will be payoff for that certainly, but but I am getting a sense of what the cost will be, um, or I can draw a line in the sand now and decide to show up differently. And it's going to take some time to adjust, and our bank account's going to take a hit. Um, but I believe that this is going to be a you know big picture. This is going to be how I want to show up, mm-hmm. and it absolutely is. And you know, we don't commit to any of these things forever, right? That's something I kept reminding myself is like, I can adjust, I can tweak, I can go back. This can continue to be an evolution, especially as my kids age, right? How I have to show up for them now will be different um, in different seasons of life. But um, it also comes, I think, you know, just a final point about all of it with a with a level of surrender that I have had to practice being comfortable with. Mm. <laughs> so kind of like you were talking about your daughter. Yes, acknowledging the disappointment and the grief and and when our expectations are not met, it does suck. Like that's not fun um, and it hurts. And, and we have to process that with people who are, are supportive of it and hear us. And once we're able to process it, to see on the other side, like, wow, I ended up right where I'm supposed to be. And I believe that and I'm going to make the most of where I am. Um, and that's, that's not a default. That's a decision that we get to make. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it is coming from a place of power yeah. and, and then also a place of privilege. And, and, and I know you acknowledge that also that, yeah. um, that sometimes some decisions are forced upon you 
And sometimes you do get to decide on purpose what the next step is. Um, yeah. um, it's really interesting. I'd love to hear more about um, your ministry. What is it that you're you're working on? Yeah, so we actually... <laughs> We um, were going to, we were part of a big community, like a, a really big church down here in Miami. And we just felt a calling to step away from that. Um, and we did so. And we visited other faith communities and other churches and never really felt like it was our home. Um, so we s- gathered with a, another couple friend of ours and we're like, what if we just got together on Sunday mornings and just like hung out and prayed and worshiped and you know, nothing, nothing big, but just something for now. And then all of a sudden there were like 20 people showing up to that and then 40 people. And then, you know, we were having to put like, take out their furniture in their living room and like line up chairs that we were renting. <laughs> um, and after it was, you know, a hundred people showing up on a Sunday, we're like, oh my goodness, I think we might've started a church. <laughs> like this was never the intent. Like I never it's wanted really cool. this title. Um, so we, rented space from a small Baptist church here in Miami. And we started gathering there and then we outgrew that space. And now we're in um, a much bigger space that we rent. But, you know, that's that's definitely been a project of building the plane as you're flying it kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, none of us with any sort of ministry backgrounds and haven't, you know, been raised in families who were um, running ministries or any of these things. So it's, that's also been a huge act of surrender and just um, not having to have all of the blueprints and all of the plans, but just the next step. Um, So as we've stepped into that, there's always been provision. There's always been um, resources. There's always been, you know, the right people just kind of appearing um, that we needed and and answering all of our prayers. So it's been such a beautiful journey that I never thought thought I would be on. Um, but it's been so fulfilling. And I know, I also know that it's just getting started and we're seeing so many amazing things happen. We're seeing marriages being restored and we're seeing people mm-hmm. being healed in their bodies and their minds and their spirits. And um, we're just seeing community being fostered and people finding, um, I think, an unconditional love that's really hard to find in other communities, people that genuinely enjoy each other. Um, so it's been, it's been really, really special. What I love hearing about this is the sparkle in your voice, yeah. and and the and I love also that you use this metaphor of building the plane and flying it, um, which is and and you talked blueprints, which is hysterical to me because in the O'Day household we literally had this conversation this weekend um, yeah. because my husband is an engineer and he wants to know all of the things first before you step forward. And that's not me. I'm like, let's just go for it and we'll see what happens. Um, And it, and it did work for me with the crockpot site. It worked with me for motherhood. It it worked for me in many, many ways. I have enough faith that I will figure it out. He wants to know for sure, no matter what. And what's interesting is earlier we were talking about like the plan laid out in the school system that should work but sometimes it doesn't and and so the the idea of of blindly following a, a a certain prescription or a certain recipe you still have to take that your intuition in check you still have to think about it so my mom for instance if she's trying a new recipe even if it's one of my recipes she'll say i don't know what happened it 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 looked done at six hours, but the recipe said this is a crock pot recipe. The recipe said seven, so I left it on. I'm like, mom, if it looked done at six hours, you were done. And she's like, well, that's not what the recipe said. So that's the part where the slow living of of using that acronym that I love for slow of simply look only within. Use your gut and your intuition. Don't just do something because the quote unquote experts have told you that. That said, if you're building a structure and a foundation, yes, <laughs> hire an structural engineer. Yes. I'm not telling you not to do that. But in general, for your life path, yeah. have faith in yourself just a little bit because that's what makes fun life fun and, and exciting. Um, otherwise, we're we're literally just living kind of groundhog day. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love I love so much about this. I um 
have a great quiz on my website, or you can just go to michellegrosser.com slash quiz, but it's about our personality patterns. And for myself, I tend to run what's called the rigid pattern. So I'm very much a rule bound rule follower. Um, so I can relate to all of that. And it's something I've had to get really curious about, right? Like, why am I, why is that such a big thing for me? Um, you know, my husband is very much not wired that way. So he'll like do a U-turn and especially early on in our relationship, I was like, no, I'm running in the road. This is like this is <laughs> terrible. Um, but I've gotten I've gotten clarity on the origin of my 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 inclination to always reference the rules. I mean, I became a lawyer, right? A lot of that is referencing rules, and I love like knowing the steps and the structure. But again, talking about costs, a cost to that being so rule bound is that I was very disconnected from my intuition, mm-hmm. and that felt very foreign to me. And as moms and as women, our brain is literally built differently than men to be able to have greater um, awareness and communication with what we call our gut instinct, right? Our gut as our second brain. So I was missing out on all of this valuable like wisdom that was within me and available to me just because I was so bound by the rules. And you're right. It's just so taught um, and and rewarded in school. Like, you, you know, this is exactly the place. And if you follow it and if you know it, and if you can regurgitate it, you're going to be rewarded. Um, And so we do that. And I think it's beautiful that you're bringing up this flexibility and this like wanting to tap into our intuition because it's so powerful, especially as moms. So how did you do that? So what, what shifted? So the first part of it was just awareness. I Uh think realizing um, that I was so quick to reference everything outside of me, i.e. all of the roles and not anything within me. So once I had that awareness, I could catch myself. Like, am I making this decision because this book says this is how I should raise my Mm. kids? Or am I actually taking a second to see if that feels right for our family and right for this child, right? Because they're all different. Um, So that the awareness was, was a big first step. And then just practice, right? Learning to, to listen to myself, learning to trust my somatic cues. That's a lot of what I teach on with the nervous system work is like our body's always communicating with us, Mm -hmm. but so often we're so busy that we don't pay attention, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to that tension in our jaw or that tension in our back or that headache or that gut issue or the insomnia or whatever it is. Um, And a lot of those are cues coming from our body. So the more that we can be aware of how it actually feels in my body to make this decision versus that one, that's a huge connection to our intuition. Um, so I just started to lean into that, even though it was for, so foreign to me. Um, and then I, I became more familiar with it. That is fantastic. I like that. I like that a lot. And I'm proud of you. It sounds so silly, but I am. I'm very proud of you for for being willing to be kind of vulnerable and uncomfortable because mm-hmm. you knew that it would help you grow as a person and then as a mom. And, and you did the that kind of uncomfortable work. And a lot of times people shy away from it. The second yes. anything is slightly uneasy or uncomfortable, we're like, red light, red light. But instead you're like, no, I know intellectually this is the right thing for me to do right now. And so I'm going to yeah. keep moving forward. So again, yes. more gold stars for you. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, and it, that's something that I've learned so much too, is that when I feel that discomfort coming up, the more I can lean into it, like those have been like, people come to me all the time. They're like, I'm feeling stuck or I'm feeling whatever. And I'm like, that's because you're not leaning into those moments. That's where those breakthroughs happen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Michelle, thank you for spending so much time with us and everyone go michellegrosser.com forward slash quiz figure out where you are. Um, I'm kind of intrigued now and now I kind of want Adam to do it too. So <laughs> if you have two new O'Days on your email list, it's from us. <laughs> oh, I love that. I would love to hear what personality pattern you are. <laughs> Thank you, Slow Down Society, for being here. I will talk to you again next week. I think you are amazing and wonderful and have a wonderful day. Do you have a slow living story to share? Leave me a voicemail at stephanieoday.com forward slash podcast with any questions, comments, feedback, or testimonials, and I will be sure to include it in an upcoming episode. 
Also, if you found value in this episode, please share it with your family and friends and subscribe through your favorite podcast provider. The more you share, comment, and leave positive reviews, the more people we can reach and share the slow living, lifestyle, and messaging. Thank you, Slow Down Society, and have an absolutely wonderful day.